politicians, I don't learn a lot. I just kind of learn why they wanted me to vote for them or you know, what their platform was or something like that. But when I listen to Ronald Reagan speeches, I learn a lot more than that. I learn what America was about. I learn what our founders intended. I learn how the principles of liberty apply in a modern world. So to me, it's just a great, great uh, topic, and I'm excited to be here. He was often referred to as a great communicator, and um, I would argue he's more of a great persuader, the great reminder. And I mean, in, in the sense, he would remind us of truths that probably somewhere in the back of our minds we knew were true, but he brought them to our attention again. He was a great teacher, and he led by inspiring us and helping us, and he, he could see what was possible through the things he taught. But I will tell you that some people, when they call him the great communicator, meant it as a backhanded compliment. Now, when I say he was a great communicator, I do not mean to, that as a back. I mean he was. He was an awesome communicator. But there, I have, you know, I've, I've talked to people who that, that was their way of saying, yeah, but he, he could read a teleprompter. It's not that bright. Okay, that was their thing. Now I'll get to that in a minute because that's a load of hooey. But 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 the bottom line is, and that's the other reason why I'm not always fond of that thing, that, that title, the great communicator, because um, to me he was probably more of the great persuader. But anyway, let's let's move on. And he one time addressed this, and I think it's very powerful what he said. I want to make him the great communicator. But I never thought it was my style or the words I used that made a difference. It was the content. I wasn't a great communicator, but I communicated great things. And they didn't spring full bloom from my brow. They came from the heart of a great nation, from our experience, our wisdom. And I believe in the principles that have guided us for two centuries. That's a pretty powerful message. It's not hard to be an effective communicator when you're communicating great things. They sometimes referred to um, to um, Bill Clinton as you know, he was good at teleprompter to give a good speech. But if I were to ask you what were some of his great lines. We're going to watch a video in a few minutes. It's 15 minutes long. The, the challenge in making a 15-minute video about Ronald Reagan um, is trying to, I could have made a four-hour movie on Ronald Reagan about just, and all of this is his words. It's not me talking about Ronald Reagan. It's just clips of Ronald Reagan. We need to get down from the hours of deep, insightful truths that he talked about and give yourself 15 minutes. Okay, so what, what would uh, Mr. Clinton's uh, big lines be? I did not have, okay, that'd be one of them. The era of big government is over, well, that was a lie, right? Depends on the it is, is. I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Okay? There's no great content there. That's why it's forgettable. That's why he's not a great communicator, because to be a great communicator, you must communicate effectively, and you must communicate great things. And that's what Ronald Reagan did. He communicated great things. Interestingly enough, though, he, he didn't say, I had great ideas, I was brilliant, and I, I had these wonderful deep thoughts, and I wanted to give them to you because I'm smart. He told us they weren't mine. They were yours. They were our nations. It's our history. It's our shared experience, our wisdom, our beliefs. It was the history of the founding. So I appreciate that humility as well. Anyhow, I think that, to me, is... Uh, is, is powerful, and perhaps will uh, um, help encapsulate what we talk about here tonight. So the other thing I like about Reagan is he understood this was important. Some people get into politics because it's a little bit like being a fan of a sports team. Now I will tell you, I'm an avid Redskin fan, okay, really avid Redskin fan. And I joke with my kids, I mean, I, I told all my daughters, when you introduce me to your intended, I'm going to ask them three questions. And one of them is, Redskins or Cowboys? Now, that's mostly in jest, um, because I understand the reality is I'm a Redskin fan because my parents lived here when I was born, and I was born and raised in the area, and I'm a Redskin fan. And had I been born and raised in Green Bay, I'd probably be a Green Bay Packers fan. Had I been born and raised in San Francisco, I'd be a San Francisco fan. Okay, so I get that. In other words, the point is it's somewhat just random. This stuff's not random. Ronald Reagan, people ought not be Republicans because it's the club they belong to. It's the fan club they belong to. They ought to be Republicans for a very different reason. And it's what he talks about right here. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We don't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same. 
And one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States when men were free. Okay, so that means he gets it. This is a vote to me because our club is cooler than their club. This is a vote for me because um, you know, our uniforms are better or our cheerleaders are hotter or whatever other stupid thing you can come up with. This is the reason. Because to be an American, you know, I mean, we're not a race. You know, I mean, you know, it's an ideal. America's the only place in the world that's an idea. Okay? You want to be a Frenchman? You don't move to France to become a Frenchman. You will not become a Frenchman by moving to France. But, but most of our ancestors came to America because they wanted something, because they believed that all men were created equal. They were endowed by their creator certain inalienable rights, and among these were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that animated them, and they came here, and that's what they believed, and that's why they were Americans. It didn't matter if their last name had an Auski on the end of it, or an Ina, or whatever, or a vowel at the end. The point was, what made you American was a commitment to the concepts of the founding. So America is a place of ideas. It's the only place like that, and that's why we can lose it. France will always be France. A thousand years from now, they could stop having great pastries and they could get rid of the Eiffel Tower, it'll still be France. Because it's a place. Now, I'll tell you, a thousand years from now, America will not be America unless we remain true to the founding principle, because America is not a place. It's an idea. Ronald Reagan understood that. Well, as I told you, the, the mainstream media dismissed him. Here you have Time Magazine. Why is this man so popular? Just, you know, frustrated by it. You've got Slate Magazine using words like stupidity. You've got uh, David Broder with the Washington Post talking about an arid desert between his ears. Clifford Clark, former Secretary of Defense of LBJ, referring to him as a dunce. You have all of this. All I can say is that these people are stupid, and they didn't do their homework. It's really very easy to prove that Ronald Reagan was a bright and intelligent man. I, I occasionally will hear um, Republicans talk about he's a great leader, but that's, that's not true. He communicated great ideas, and he was fluent in the principles of liberty, and he was fluent in the ideas of our, our founding. I should say real quickly here, this isn't really designed to be a lecture. So I, um, I, we will certainly have time at the end for questions if, if we don't have anyone who wants to interject during the presentation, and I'm okay with that too. But um, to be perfectly honest, uh, we have a microphone here, and if something on the screen or something I've said strikes a chord with you and you want to make a comment or, or ask a question, I, I would ask maybe not to give alternative speeches, because I, I do have to end on time, and I don't want to have um, all my time taken up by, by somebody giving a, a, an alternative speech. But definitely we want input. So this must be interactive. I, I probably should have said that to start off with. So um, please don't be intimidated by the fact there's a microphone here. Okay? It's, it's supposed to be used. It was here for a reason. It's not just there as an ornament. And, uh, so you're, you're welcome to. But if, if it seems daunting to get up in the middle of something and do it, then we can do it at the end. In which case, if, and, and we'll, if we have to, we'll flog you to get questions out of you. OK, just kidding about the flogging, promise. Don't run through the doors. Um, but at any rate, so this is how you know that not tr this isn't true. My wife got me this wonderful book. My wife's back here, lovely lady here, uh, third row from the back. Um, <laughs> and Ronald Reagan, and she um, said to me, you know, she got me this book, Reagan in His Own Hand. And I'll, what it is, people think of presidents having speech writers, and so we think, oh yeah, we give a lot of speeches, and people wrote his speeches for him. And it's true, he's in the White House, he did have some great speech writers, people like uh, Peggy Noonan and so forth. But he was actually giving political speeches for decades before he became president. And he was his own speech writer, and how do we know that? Because we have legal pads. You know those yellow legal pads? He wrote them in his own handwriting, double spaced them, and then he would go in and scribble things out and, and, and make his own edits to his own speeches. He's, he would speak every single week, multiple times, going around for GE, speaking in different factories and so forth when he was a representative for GE. Um, the point is, he thought about these things deeply. These weren't thoughts that some very intelligent person put in front of him and that he read effectively on a teleprompter. That may be how Bill Clinton did it. That may be how Barack Obama does it. That is not how Ronald Reagan did it. Okay? If you've written, so anyhow, this is a great quote up here. But he, he was an intellectual powerhouse. So I'm offended when people act like he wasn't that smart. 
because it is not inappropriate to word the, you, the phrase intellectual powerhouse when you talk about Ronald Reagan, his understanding of the American family. I see a hand back here. For those who may not be able to hear her, I'll just try to summarize quickly. Um, she was referring to a Saturday Night Live skit in which um, they put on this whole uh, skit of him in the cabinet meeting. And, and when the camera was on, he was kind of you know, probably falling asleep and not being, pay, paying attention. And everyone else was really in, on top of things. And he did surround himself with smart people, but he was unfortunately not up to their speed. And then when the camera would go away from him, all of a sudden he would jump into action and he would give directions and, and, and lead the cabinet in a way that just was impressive. And the answer is that's you know that was supposed to be a joke, but it was true. Um, and the funny, the, the, how do we know this? Because members of his cabinet, the man has been dead now for a decade, basically. And and people will come forward and say, yeah, I was the real brains behind the operation. How often we see that happen? And yet that hasn't been the case. You know, I, I know Ed Meese personally. I, I've talked to Ed Meese many times. Ed Meese believes in Ronald Reagan like you can't believe. Ed Meese never says. I was the real legal brains behind the operation. And I haven't heard other people say that. Sir, what you hear is that this was a great man and a great leader. So, but if you ever read this book, you cannot read his speeches and come to the conclusion that this is not a bright man. You just can't. I'm sorry. Someone didn't write these for them. He wrote them in his own hand. It's the title of the book. So that's exhibit A to anyone who, who, who's unwilling to accept the phrase intellectual powerhouse. All right, so um, we're going to watch a few things for you to watch through. It's about 15 minutes long. It's nobody talking about Ronald Reagan. It's just Ronald Reagan. And the challenge for me was to just, I mean, I, it could, like I said, you could come in the afternoon and say, why didn't you include this? And the answer is because we didn't have, we couldn't be here till next Monday. Uh, the, so, but, but I want you to watch for some things, okay? As you, as you, don't just be entertained. Watch. Watch about how he talks about freedom and opportunity, how he talks about opposing evil. Talk, look at how he deals with that values, things like family and faith. Look at his historical perspective of, of the Constitution, American exceptionalism. His understanding of American exceptionalism was profound. I mean, he, it was like he was a PhD type person when it comes to understanding that. There are people who think that American exceptionalism is, uh, is thinking that America is better than every place else and that we're better. Um, you know, one time I want uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Obama was asked, do you believe in American exceptionalism? He says, of course I do. I believe in American exceptionalism. It's like the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. I believe in Greek exceptionalism. <laughs> they simply don't. Now, they may have national pride, and they may think you know, they once had a great culture, and they may think it's a, a cool place to live, or a nice place to vacation, but they do not believe that they have any special mission in the world, or that they, that anything like that. And American exceptionalism, isn't that Americans are better, or that the soil in America is better, or that our DNA is superior? It's about the role that America plays in the world. It's about the, the principles of liberty and freedom and the difference that that makes. There's a reason why America is the primary innovator in the world. Most all the patents in the world happen here. Is that because Americans are smarter? I don't think so. Nobel Prizes too. Yeah, Nobel Prizes too. And the reason for this is simply we have a society that encourages innovation, encourages creativity. That's what freedom does. Freedom unleashes the human mind. And so that's what he understood. He, he understood that what makes America special is the role that it plays and the rules that we've created for our society. And if we want to continue to have that be the case, we need to make sure that we're willing to, uh, to understand that. But it's not nationalism. American exceptionalism is, oh, we're better than everybody else. Those other countries are losers. It's not that. It's It's this set. Why it's a special place? Anyhow, listen to his tone, how positive, optimistic he is. Listen to how he uses humor when, he, when he's critical of uh, sometimes his opponents. Look at how he uses humor to do it rather than just calling them names or being mean. It's a very, very interesting kind of uh, way of, of, of doing this. And then I really like his humility. You saw an evidence of his humility when he talked about how he wasn't a great communicator. 
He only communicated great things. They weren't even his things. They were somebody else's page writing. I mean, the, the humility of, of all of that. Um, he's not a me guy. He doesn't get up and give you a speech about how awesome he is. He's giving you a speech about how awesome America is. And I, I really love that. So those are some things I want you to watch for. The other thing I want you to do is listen to how timeless the things he says are. You will hear things that he said in the late 50s. So I think that he cut these tapes this morning to address issues that our nation is facing today. And I think that's impressive. Try doing that with... Uh, with um, someone like Bill Clinton. Take this stuff, stuff, listen to it, and you just kind of roll your eyes and say, why were we even interested in this claptrap? But at any rate, so you move on. He spoke clearly, plainly. He also spoke eloquently. And then finally, of course, he spoke aspirationally. He encourages us to aim higher. He, always took. he never believed that we had to follow him. He viewed it as his obligation to encourage us and give us the reason to follow him. It was an entreating, invitational sort of thing. And so the pressure was on him. He would get on television in the, in the evening you know, to discuss America, what we needed to do. And it wasn't, I'm president. You've got to do what I think we need to do. It was, we have a problem here. Let's solve it. This is how we think we need to solve it. And with the sheer power of his ideas, he was right, and then we coalesced around him. I love that because it's based on freedom. He respected us. As citizens, as sovereign citizens, we weren't obligated to do what he told us to do. But we were obligated by the power of ideas to believe in a better future. And so to me, that's powerful. So with that, let's uh, watch. And I guess we can probably turn on the lights if we want that one. It is time for us to realize that we are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. We are not, as some would have us believe, doomed to an inevitable decline. I do not believe in a fate that will fall on us no matter what we do. I do believe in a fate that will fall on us if we do nothing. Those who say that we are in a time when there are no heroes they just don't know where to look. You can see heroes every day going in and out of factory gates. Others, a handful of number, produce enough food to feed all of us and then the world beyond. You meet heroes across a counter, and they're on both sides of that counter. There are entrepreneurs with faith in themselves and faith in an idea who create new jobs, new wealth, and opportunity. There are individuals and families who take taxes, support the government, and whose voluntary gifts support church, charity, and education. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. But I remember the story of a fellow who was running for office as a Republican, and he was in a rural area and it wasn't known to be Republican and he stopped by a farm to do some campaigning and when the farmer heard he was a Republican his jaw dropped and he said wait right here till I go get Ma. She's never seen a Republican before. <laughs> so he got her and the candidate looked around for a podium from which to give his speech and the only thing he could find was a pile of that stuff that Bess Truman took 35 years trying to get Harry to call fertilizer. <laughs> so he got up on the mound, and when they came back, he gave his speech. And at the end of it, the farmer said, that's the first time I ever heard a Republican speech. And the candidate said, that's the first time I've ever given a Republican speech from a Democratic platform. <laughs> the trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, for three decades, we've sought to solve the problems of unemployment through government planning. And the more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. We have so many people who can't see a fat man standing beside a thin one without coming to the conclusion the fat man got that way by taking advantage of the thin one. That no one in this country should be denied medical care because of a lack of funds. But I think we're against forcing all citizens regardless of need, into a compulsory government program. 
No government ever voluntarily reduces itself in size. So government programs, once launched, never disappear. Actually, a government bureau is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. They told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy accommodation. And they say if we'll only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy, he'll learn. The history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. The United States of America is unique in world history because it has a genius for leaders, many leaders on many levels. But back in 1976, Mr. Carter said, trust me, and a lot of people did. And now many of those people are out of work. Many have seen their savings eaten away by inflation. And today, a great many who trusted Mr. Carter wonder if we can survive the national defense. Trust me, government, asks that we concentrate our hopes and dreams on one man, that we trust him to do what's best for us. Well, my view of government places trust not in one person or one party that transcend persons and parties. But, and I would like to leave that person to take government off the ballot of the great and turn you loose again and that you can tell us you did them and made this country great. There. Any doubt in your mind, such as you Mr. Troy and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes. I and our hope. I did not take the oath I've just taken with the intention of presiding over the dissolution of the world's strongest economy. In the days ahead, I will money and reduce productivity. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. About a fellow who went to the KGB to report that he lost his parents. Asked him why he was bothering men. Why didn't he just report it to the local police? And he answered, I just want you to know that I don't agree with a thing my parrot has to say. Note the law's description of pirates, hostis humanus. The enemies of all mankind. No place on earth gives. We must act together, or unilaterally if necessary, to ensure that terrorists have no sanctuary anywhere. <laughs> Letter came from me. Peter Sweeney, he's in the second grade in the Riverside School in Rockville Center. And he said, I hope you'll get well quick, or you might have to make a speech in your pajamas. <laughs> All we need to begin with is a dream that we can do better than before. All we need and that dream will come true. All we need to do is act. And the time for action is now. Thank you. The story was an American and a Russian arguing about their two countries. And the American said, look, in my country, I can walk into the Oval Office. I can pound the president's desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. 
The American said, you can? He says, yes. I can go to the Kremlin, to the General Secretary's office, pound his desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs> I'm describing now is a plan and a hope. Long term, Leninism, Leninism, our self expression of the people. Well, I believe there's a better way of eliminating the threat of nuclear war. It is a strategic defense initiative aimed ultimately at finding non ballistic missiles. It's the most hopeful possibility of the nuclear age. But it's not very well understood. Some say it will bring war to the heavens. But its purpose is to deter war in the heavens and on earth. And some say the research would be expensive. Perhaps. But it could save millions of lives, indeed humanity itself. And some say if we build such a system, the Soviets will build a defense system of their own. Well, they already have strategic defenses that surpass ours a civil defense system where we have almost none, and a research program covering roughly the same areas of technology that we're now exploring. And finally, some say the research will take a long time. Well, the answer to that is, let's get started. Today is the day who knows from all the people of our country. And I want to say something for the school children of America who are watching the live coverage of the Shadows I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes being, it's all part of a process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance of expanding men's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the thin party. It belongs to the brave. Challenge of crew is putting us into the future, and we'll continue to follow. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning. As they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye, and slipped the soul bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. While we Americans detest war, we love freedom and stand ready to sacrifice for it. We love freedom not only because it's practical and beneficial, but because it is morally right and just. In advancing freedom, we Americans carry a special burden, a belief in the dignity of man in this country. General, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Thanks Bigger rocks, stronger than oceans, wind swept, bad blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city that really fails them. And the communist creativity. And see it still. And how stands the city of these women at? More prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, at 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the ground of age, and her blows have struggled, no matter what strength. And she still a beacon for all who must have food, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who have heard her true about this great man. We've done our part, and as I walk off into the city streets, I find the word of the men and women who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did. We weren't just the little difference. We made the city stronger, and we left it in good hands. Not bad.
not right at all. And so, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. God bless America. And say And I'm suffering, and I see it's monster, the monster of the door. And I will take It is time for us to realize that we are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. We have every year, after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you. Thank you. I always love how if you watch closely there, you can see the emotion in his lips as he concludes that speech. But at any rate, what I love about those things we've seen is that he was fluent in the language of freedom. He understood down to his core, it was imprinted on his DNA, the principles that make America work. And he, he didn't recite talking points. You could tell this was stuff he knew in his heart. He was simply sharing the things that he knew. And he explained what needed to be done. Did you see how in the State of the Union address we talked about missile defense? It wasn't just a list of something that he said, I'm going to put this on your thing, and I want you to pass it. That's how most of our th those stupid addresses look now. The president stands up, tells people how to vote, and demands they pass his bill. He didn't do that. He never once said, you must pass this bill. What did he do? He explained to them why it was needed. He gave them the arguments, pro and con, and explained to the public. And as a result, of course, we're freer and safer today because we have those kinds of things. But that's the amazing power of being a persuader. Because in a free society where the people are sovereign, he's not the king. He can't tell me what to do. He can't tell me what to believe. But what he can do is win my heart with truth. And he understood that. And that's why he was a great leader. But um, and so that's one of the things I really liked about his leadership style if you look at kind of what he did. Now, of course, freedom works and it pr provides awesome results. Um, you know, if you want to, they, they, they will tell uh, you know, people who look at processes in business understand that you have to change things to get different results. You can't just kind of hope for different results. And I think our founders understood that. So when they created this country, they built it on a, a number of things. They built it on the principle of uh, the people were sovereign. Okay, so that means that you and I are in charge. That was designed to essentially, if you will, democratize in the hands of the people. And the free market does the same thing, except it puts the economic power in the hands of the people. Now, we often, in, in politics today, you talk about how you listen to Bernie Sanders talk, and you think that uh, you know, the big corporations are so much more powerful than they are. Interesting enough, you know what? ExxonMobil, as big as it is, can't make me buy any gas from them. And they can't make you buy any gas from them. And if we all chose not to buy gas from them, they'd go out of business in a short order. Because the beauty of the, of the free market system is 
that we actually are also, just like a democracy, sovereign. Now you could say, well, I'm just one person in the political system. I, I don't get to decide who the president is. Well, that's true. I understand. Just one of us doesn't. But collectively, we do the same thing in the marketplace. I may not by myself be able to force a corporation in any one direction, but we do collectivists. It's the same principle. The marketplace is designed to maximize individual freedom. And the system of limited government, where the people are sovereign, is designed to give us maximum freedom. I think that's important. And he knew all of this. This wasn't something that he needed someone like me or, or uh, one of his speechwriters to explain. He knew all of this. So when someone gave him a speech, if it had a mistake in it or something he felt sent the wrong message, he was absolutely in a heartbeat. He could pull out his pen, just like he'd done so many times before, make a few edits, correct it, and be teaching Americans the truth. I think that's important. Of course, it promotes national security, uh, which is important, obviously. There's a world full of people who hate us and want to do harm to us, and, and we need to have a strong defense. He understood that as well. He wasn't afraid to confront evil. Because he understood there was evil. When you're a moral relativist, it's hard to confront evil. When you understand that there's evil and you can accept that, then it's not really that big a deal to confront it. And he was willing to. Our current president seems not willing to confront evil. There's times where he is much more willing to call names to his political adversaries here in the United States than he is terrorists. I mean, his most most of the time he most of the time he refers to uses the word terrorist. He's referring to the Republicans in Congress. He's not referring to ISIS most of the time. You can check it out. Google it. I mean, it's just it's very frustrating. And you watch him when he's angry, when he when his peak is up, and you can see fire in his eyes. I know what he's talking about. He's either talking about Americans who aren't with him, or he's talking about a Congress that's not with him. He's not talking about ISIS. He's not talking about Putin. He's not talking about Kim Jong Un. He's not talking about the Mullahs in Iran. He's talking about us. That's who makes him upset. That's to me very discouraging. So anyhow, uh, but th that that I think though is the genius of a Reagan is, is he respected us, and so he talked to us like he respected us. Well, the other thing he did is he inspired. I have a theory of leadership. I know that some people think leadership is commanding people and telling them what to do, and ordering them about, and speaking in a gruff tone, and then they go do it. Um, and and maybe I'm I'm wrong on this, but I I think. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to imagine what it's like to be a president necessarily, but, but I can imagine what it's like to be a scoutmaster. I've been a scoutmaster for many, many years of my life. I've got seven boys. Two of them are here. Uh, Jefferson, who is already an Eagle Scout, and CJ will be a, an Eagle Scout in the very near future. Um, all, my other, all my other boys are Eagles as well. Um, and uh, I, I learned my interest in scouting from my mother, who's also here, by the way. She's uh, right behind my attractive wife. She's the other attractive blonde right, right here. But um, you can say that about your mother, right? Play in front of your wife. I don't normally make. I don't generally compliment attractive blondes, um, you because know, it's you know. But my, my wife never gets upset when I refer to my my mom as an attractive blonde. So anyhow, but um, but but the bottom line is, um, he. Let's say I'm on a on a hike. Now all these boys are tired. They got backpacks on. We're we're going up a mountain, uh, and it's it's tired, tiring. I, I can kind of get behind him and kick him in the rear end and say, come on, let's get going. Stop being a wind. Pick up your path. we got to move. I'm not sure that's leadership. That's just pulling rank on him and saying, you know, you got to do it because I'm bigger than you or something. Um, I, I think leadership is probably finding a clearing in the woods and pointing up the mountain peak we're climbing and point it out to him and talk about what we're going to see on the way. Let him know that we're going to see some fantastic things. We're experiencing great things. We're going to see some of the most awesome things that God's created. But in order to do that, we've got to put our backs on and make up this hill. And let them know it will be worth it, even though it will be hard. I think that's leadership. And that's what Ronald Reagan did. He didn't order us about. He wasn't a ruler. He governed. And there's a difference between ruling and governing. And I, I want to hear your comment, but what I want to ask you to do is have someone pass the mic to him. Because then uh, I won't repeat what you say nearly as effectively as you say. Good point. I was reading a book by Bill O'Reilly about killing Reagan, and uh, one of the stories that relates to me because I was in the FAA. I, I've been in the FAA 25 years, and Reagan expressed, or, or Reagan showed true leadership when he fired the air traffic controllers. He gave them an ultimatum, and I think he needed to stand up to the Soviets at that time. And this is his way of kind of showing great leadership. 
deciding to let them go at that's a very interesting point. Um, the, one of the things, that, I'm glad you brought that up, because what, after the survey asked a um, former member of the Pull-Up Bureau, he was speaking at Harvard University, I forget his name now, but he spoke at Harvard, and he was asked, um, kind of at what point did you realize that Reagan was going to be a pretty, uh, uh, you know, a pretty effective adversary? When, when did you realize that you, you had all you could handle? And he said there was two things, really that were very, very powerful that most Americans didn't understand. And one of them was that. You wouldn't think. But he said, when he fired the FAA people, and he said he'd have to if they didn't follow the law, we knew we had someone who would do something that was even politically difficult and perhaps unpopular. And he said the other thing was, when he referred to us as the evil empire, he says, in the Pravda, we joked about it, and the Pravda covered it and laughed at it like it was silly. And he says, you know what? We all knew in our heart of hearts he was right. And he says, it crushed us. That's the power of truth. Even the communists understood he was right. So anyhow. Um, so he was optimistic, but realistic. So you know, if I point through the mountains, and I point out to a mountain that's 350 miles away, and I tell the boys we're going to get there by evening time, that's not good leadership, because they know that that's not possible. But, but you, can, you can lead people to great things. Leaders also focus on the follower, if you will, the person that's following them, not on themselves. And I think you see Reagan doing that as well. I didn't hear a lot of talk there about him. He may reference himself occasionally, like you know, people say I'm a great communicator, but then he turns it back and says, but it's not me. Right? Someone asked him a question about him, and he turned the conversation back to America. It's ideals, the things it believes, it's history, it's traditions, it's wisdom. So to me, that's that, that again is a sign of a leader, and I, I'm impressed by it. We can learn so much of this. Of course, he spoke to lead and encourage. Um, he didn't really tell us what we wanted to hear. He told us what we needed to hear. Um, now, maybe some of us wanted to hear what he had to say because it, we understood it and hungered for it. But much of America didn't. And um, you know, much of America didn't agree with him initially. But he built consensus by speaking truth effectively and persuading. And whatever else history may say about me when I'm gone, I hope it will record that I appeal to your best hopes not your worst fears, to your confidence rather than your doubts. And that's another thing I love about the man. His optimism, his just approach to life. It was just, there's a power in that optimism. Um, you know, I, Eeyore, uh, I'm a father of seven children, so forgive me for uh, citing Eeyore, but Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, um, two great things I learned from Winnie the Pooh. One is the great statement that Winnie the Pooh makes, the more it looked, the more it wasn't there. And that's a, once you understand that actually makes perfect sense when you're thinking about the things that sometimes liberals say, then you realize that Winnie the Pooh is actually very smart. <laughs> the, the other thing, of course, is, the, uh, is that Eeyore isn't going to make things happen, because Eeyore is convinced that everything's you know, never going to work out. Um, so while it's OK to have your down day every now and then, the reality is if we get things happening and working well, we have to be an optimist, because you have to see the possibilities to get to the next level. Anyhow, um, I also think it's important, Reagan understood why he was a conservative. There was never a time that he was misunderstanding the reason he was conservative. It wasn't because it was popular, because sometimes it's not. And it certainly wasn't because it's easy. I will tell you, it's much easier to be a liberal, much, much easier. Because if you're a liberal, you can say things like, I think everybody should have free health care. I mean, you know, that's so easy. You, just, you, know, you hear Bernie Sanders say all the time, everyone, you know, everyone goes gaga over that stuff. It's easy to explain that. It's much harder to explain why that's actually ineffective and why it guarantees that people will get poor health care. And it will be very expensive for health care. And then you have to understand economics. You have Understand all the free market would work better. So to be a conservative is hard work. It's like okay, give it for parents. You can all understand the difference with a parent raised a teenager. It's easy to be a teenager's friend because you tell them what they want to hear, you let them have what they want to have, and they like you and they're happy, right? Except for my boys because they're very mature. But um, they like it when I don't let them have what they want because you know, they're just so mature. What's well, hard is being a parent sometimes and saying no, that's not how we do it. And the reason it's harder is because you have to explain things in the long run, and it's not always easy, and people don't like it. And I would say that's, you know, the, politically, the grown-ups in the room are the conservatives. And politically, the, the, 
the people who just want to be your buddy, your friend, but not a true friend, just kind of like your playmate, those are liberals. Let us tell you whatever it is they think they want to hear. He understood that. So you don't be a conservative because it's easy. Don't be it because it's fun. Don't even, don't, don't even be a liberal because you want to I mean, excuse me, don't be a conservative because you want to stop liberals from taking your stuff. That's fine. I'll tell you why Ronald Reagan was a conservative. It was this, because he believed that the founding principles of our nation provide the most freedom and opportunity and well-being to everyone. Now, that, that certainly does involve people who's not taking your stuff. But that wasn't the real reason. That was just kind of like a you know, side benefit. Um, the truth of the matter is the rich can afford big government. It's the rest of us who can't. You know, I mean, think about it. Bill Gates, you could take half of everything he owns. You could confiscate it. He would still have the biggest house, and he'd still be one of the most wealthy men, men in the world. But you do that to a single mom? Who's working two jobs to support a family and trying to get you know her young children perhaps ahead, so they'll have a better life than right now. She's feeling like she's providing them. That's devastating. So if you're rich, maybe it's easy to say, well, big government's okay, I can afford it. But for the rest of us, big government is devastating. And he understood that. That's why he was a conservative. It wasn't because it was the cool club. It wasn't because the cheerleaders were the best. It was because it's what made people happier, freer, more secure. And that's what he's about. And that's what we should be about. And I also think sometimes when we, when we fall in the trap of acting like we're upset because government wastes too much money and that's the only reason we're conservatives is to stop waste, I think stopping waste is great. But it falls in the trap, though, that the, the, the media tells about us, which is that we're greedy. We don't, you know, I always find it odd. Why is it we're greedy? You want more of my money. Um, and, and because I am upset that you're wasting it, I'm the greedy one. But you're the one always reaching into my pocket. You know, it's like the pickpocketer. When he reaches in your pocket, you grab his hand. And he says, stop being greedy. Like, you know, that's the way it goes. But the bottom line is it does fall in their trap. They like to call us greedy. So let's not focus so much on whether or not it's wasteful. Let's, uh, let's talk about why we are conservative. We don't want to waste. Be the reason why we don't want to waste money is because we understand the principles. If I waste money, I've just taken it from you. You can't put it to productive use, and now I'm going to squander it on something stupid. And I've taken an opportunity from this man. I've taken freedom from this man. I've robbed him to some potential of his future, perhaps his children's future, because he's saving for college. That's why waste is bad, right? And I think we, we sometimes have to explain it better. Ron Reagan always knew how to explain it. So anyhow, of course, um, it doesn't matter the issue. I'll give you the quick story on, on minimum wage. It's easy to say minimum wage should be higher, right? Because we all want people to make more money. Heck, I wish the minimum wage were $100 an hour. That'd be awesome, right? Um, but the problem is, it just makes people unemployed. And uh, Ronald Reagan understood this. I'll give you a quick story in my, my own life. My grandfather um, was the youngest of six children. His dad died when he was two. Um, and they were a poor family. He got his first job at a young age, probably an age that would be criminal by today standards. His job was to deliver uh, water around to construction workers. And they didn't pay him very much, but it was worth it if you're not paying him much to not have the workers you're paying more to, you know, get off the job for a minute and go get water. So instead, he brought the water to them and, and that kept them, uh, it was you know, economically feasible, right? So he's making like a quarter week or something that's completely immoral and wrong. And, um, you know, by today's standards, uh, you know, that's where it would be. But I, the, the, sto yeah, the story ends. My grandfather's 25. He owns this company. He owns this company. I repeat, just in case you didn't hear that. It wasn't a McJob. He was delivering water. Worse than a McJob. And he owned the company. When I ran for Congress one time, one of my biggest supporters was, a, was an immigrant, legal immigrant from the United, to the United States. His first job in the U.S. was flipping burgers. It was a McJob. And he was one of my biggest supporters. Do I know what his job was? He owned 25 McDonald's. Okay, that's what opportunity is about. But the bottom line is the economy is like a ladder. And ladders work best if the rungs start low. If the, if the first rung on the ladder is up here, unless you're Abdul Jabbar or Shaq O'Neal, that ladder doesn't do any good. And my grandfather, as a, you know, the other, as a, in his circumstances, he wasn't that tall. Well, he's actually a big man and tall, but the metaphor that I'm using, he needed the rung to be low. And the rung was low enough that he could get on that ladder and climb up. And one day he's at the top of the ladder. But that was because the, the, the minimum wage just raises up that first rung, so it makes it difficult, is all I'm getting at. 
I'm all over people making lots of money. I think that's awesome. That's what America's about. I mean, my, uh, my wife's grandfather, wonderful story, the son of immigrants from Greece. He comes to America. He, uh, he um, basically has a high school education. He drives a bread truck for his living as, a, as an adult. That's what he, he delivers bread. Okay? He retires, and, and, and uh, when we were, uh, he, he's passed away, of course, but when we were uh, newly about to go visit, he lived on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean in San Clemente, California. Okay? That's where uh, President Nixon retired to. I don't think his view was as good. This is a man, this is a man who drove a bread truck. This is America. This is what America's about. Because in America, that can happen. When I was in Italy, I knew a man who was a world-renowned doctor. And he had a nice view of the Adriatic Ocean in his town called Pescara. In an apartment building. In an apartment building. Again, in an apartment building. A world-renowned doctor. My grandfather on my wife's side was a delivery, a bread truck delivery man, and he owned what Italians would call a villa overlooking the Pacific Ocean. That's America. And that's why these things matter, because you have to have that. It doesn't happen with the One of the things I liked about, uh, of course, economically, you kind of already talked about this, but you look what he did. What I loved was uh, they used to call it Reaganomics to make fun of it. And then it started working. And he said to one of his friends, have you noticed they don't call it Reaganomics anymore? Because uh, they didn't want to give him credit anymore. They, they found other names, so it trickled down or something else, but don't call it Reaganomics. Um, I, I, just a question here, anyone? Do we still call it Obamacare or we stop calling it Obamacare? What does that tell you, that we still call it Obamacare? That, it's, that we want him to get the credit. The blame. The blame, exactly. Um, so I, I think that's instructive. That question here. Uh, and, uh, was it the George Bush Sr. who referred to Reagan's policy as voodoo economics? It was primary uh, when they were running against each other, and um, uh, you know George Bush uh, became his vice president, and uh, to his credit, I think he became a loyal vice president. And um, I don't know that he was initially. Uh, on board economically, and I don't believe that the champion, for example, the sanctity of life that Ronald Reagan was, but he um, he did learn and grow, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, but interestingly enough, he won his term because people <laughs> believed him to be the third term of Ronald Reagan. And I think when they concluded that maybe he wasn't, is when he didn't get his fourth yeah, term. Exactly. But, uh, but but having said that, uh, what you said is true. Uh, defending America. Now, this picture here I'm, I'm kind of uh, particularly fond of. This here is my former boss. That's Senator Malcolm Wallop. Um, he is actually the uh, father of American uh, missile defense uh, ide ideas in America. He uh, was a friend of Ronald Reagan's, and at Paul Axel's ranch in the mid 70s, he sat down and talked with him, talked about missile defense. Uh, Malcolm Wallop was very bright. He went to Yale. He's from Wyoming, but he uh, went to Yale. And he did. I'm sorry. That's, that's why he's my boss. He started for. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Malcolm Wallop, when he retired from the Senate, started for Tuesday Freedom. He, he was my boss. He's a, he was the chairman of the board uh, until his passing a few years ago. And uh, he hired me, and, and uh, I'm a big fan of his. But anyhow, he sat down at a breakfast, a uh, casual breakfast at Paul Axel's ranch with me, Paul, and, um, and, and Ronald Reagan back in the 70s. And he explained to him missile defense. And he said Ronald Reagan immediately understood it. He says, and I was just talking to him at over breakfast. I says, I've gone into people with you know, engineering degrees, and I've had charts and all kinds of information and explained it to them. They just looked at me like, yeah, I think mutually for the, the shared destruction looks fine. What are we, what, what, what are we missing? It sounds like a, you can't hit a bullet with a bullet. Well, actually, you can. It's just simple geometry. Now, you and I might not be able to do this example of our thing out fast, our gun fast enough, aim it. But the truth is, if you hook up guns to computers, and they, uh, you know, they can track each other, you can hit it 100% of the time because it's actually all very predictable. Missiles are a little bit harder because they have the ability to move a little bit more, whereas a bullet just goes and has a, pr a predictable decline rate. But the reality is, we do it today. Don't tell me we can't do it. I mean, you know, it's like tell you can't fly. Um, let's see, Wright Brothers, Dallas Airport, land on the moon. You know, I, I, you can't do that. Uh, well, I think you can do that, which has been done. So that argument's over, is my point. Ronald Reagan wins that argument. All the people who said you can't do it, they were the dummies. 
and Mr. Reagan was a smart guy. But my, my, my boss was a friend of his and a political ally. And, and just so you know, I, I'm a big fan of Margaret Thatcher, but even she wasn't supportive of missile defense initially. She thought it sounded like it was just a way too much, uh, you know, not a good idea, would uh, cost too much and perhaps weaken the ability of, of, of the United States to defend itself from the rest of the world. But he stood his ground and won. And today we're safer as a result of it. So to me, these are important uh, principles. Here's the wisdom. I love this sentence, because in one sentence he describes uh, what, the, what defense is all about. History teaches us that wars begin when governments believe the price of aggression is cheap. In other words, it's, it's simply economics. If it doesn't donuts, it's a buck, you'll buy a lot of them. If it doesn't donuts, cost $100,000, you won't buy very many. If aggression looks like it's on sale this week, you'll buy more if you're a you know, dictator. You know, if Putin looks at aggression and says, hey, it looks price is cheap this week, Barack Obama's selling it cheap. Then you will. And if they look around and say, hmm, looks like me, Ronald Reagan's up the price on aggression. I guess I won't be buying it this week. I'll go buy something else. That's how it works. I mean, just brilliant. In one sentence. That's what I love. But anyhow. So the other thing I like is peace through strength. He always talked about peace through strength. He didn't say peace through military strength because he understood it was more than that. He actually understood that that, that was an important component. But we had to be economically strong. We had to be morally strong. He believed that all of that was important. So he didn't just focus on the military. That was an important part of it, because you can't necessarily pray yourself to safety either. But he understood that, but the, that, that our, our moral fiber <coughs> combined with our economic strength, combined with a military that was properly trained, funded, armed, with, uh, you know, that, we, that we'd be unstoppable. He understood that. And, Again, this is the guy that wasn't, you know, he, he, this is the guy the desert between the ears, right? That's what David Brother says in Washington Post. Yeah. All right. Now, this is, again, I think something that's important. Uh, he always prayed privately before uh, cabinet meetings. That's why I think it's always appropriate we begin this meeting with prayer, even though it's not really a church function. Um, Ronald Reagan, before he went to a cabinet meeting, he would step off into a side office and have a personal prayer on his own. And occasionally he was late because the prayer took too long. And he'd, he'd excuse himself for being a minute or two late. But because uh, unlike uh, Mr. Clinton, he wasn't you know, chronically late. He was rarely late. But anyhow, this is... Uh, but it is our spiritual commitment, more than all the military might in the world, that will win our struggle for peace. It is not bombs and rockets, but belief and resolve. It is humility before God that is ultimately the source of America's strength as a nation. Well, I think that's pretty powerful. There's not much I can say other than to say, wow, when was the last time we had a president who talked like that? And again, that's a truth. To me, that's just a truth. It may not be politically correct, but it's a truth. Now, I love this humility. He had a sign on his desk where it, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go. If he doesn't mind, he gets the credit. And that's how Ronald Reagan was. That's why his speeches weren't about me and about I. When you, when you listen to uh, Mr. Obama speak, He's constantly telling us what a great president he's been, how successful he's been, how we're so respected in the world, how the economy is just humming along, how we have been just, how he saved us from the brink. You know, me think if he must protest too much. <clears throat> Anyhow, Reagan didn't seek praise. When he did talk about what had been accomplished, he turned it and gave the credit to the American people, its principles, and to God. He saw himself and he acted as if he were a servant of the people. That's how he treated us. Um, you, you look at, you know, I mean, this was a man who didn't walk in the room and say, I'm the president, I'm in charge here. He walked into the room, and his attitude was, I need to convince you, because you are freely sovereign people. And then he did. And of course, uh, I love what Mother Teresa said about him, a little picture of her over there. When I say little, you can see Nancy Reagan wasn't uh, a particularly tall or big woman, and, and uh, Mother Teresa's tiny, but anyhow. In this man, greatness and simplicity are one. I like that. Well, he led a great revolution, uh, as, as you know. His vision and leadership transformed America on so many different levels. It was economics, it was military, it, was, it renewed our moral fiber as a nation. Um, and what was interesting was he wasn't preaching to us all the time. I mean, he wasn't like the pastor in chief, but he created an environment in which we could, again, this is that great quote we just listened to. Turn our thoughts to some of the more weightier matters of the world. And I think that's important. 
Um, he renewed our faith and hope and optimism, and we became proud to be Americans again. I have a friend who used to be a pilot for American Airlines, and he told me that he used to fly to Europe all the time. And when Carter was president, he said everybody was incredibly disrespectful of America and Americans. It was amazing. He said almost overnight, once Ronald Reagan was elected, people treated America in a different tone in a different way. So it's funny how the local, you know, here, what we hear is, you know, He's just a cowboy. He's not respected internationally. And he said, that's not what I experienced when I got on a plane and flew to foreign airports. So Americans were proud, and the rest of the world took notice. But I think what's interesting is he was the president of the United States, and yet his influence was felt across the globe. It, it, it didn't just stop here. Um, he was ridiculed when he called the Soviets the evil empire. There are people who actually said it was irresponsible of him to say that. Um, he stood in front of the great symbol of Soviet repression, that Berlin Wall. That's the, that's the Brandenburg Gate there, uh, where he told him to open the gate, and then he said tear down the wall, because opening the gate wasn't, wasn't quite enough. Yes, sir. Could, you, could you confirm or uh, disconfirm the, the uh, story that the speech at the Brandenburg Gate, Reagan kept putting... Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and the speechwriters and the State Department kept taking it out, and he kept writing it back in, and then at the final, the final written copy did not have it in, and he went ahead with his that, words. That is exactly true. That is exactly true. Um, all of the, the diplomats and all of the speechwriters uh, kept saying, That's, that can't be in there. That's too provocative. You've got to pull that out. And his attitude was, it's the truth. And just like with the evil empire, um, truth is powerful. It has an impact. He, for example, I don't know if you remember, he called um, Gaddafi the mad dog of the Middle East. Yeah. He, he picked those words carefully. To Americans, it sounds kind of silly, kind of cartoonish. But in the Middle East, it was a tremendous sign of contempt and disrespect. And it, the message was not to Americans. It was to the international community, which was, I don't respect this man. He's a punk. And uh, but he did it in those words. And truth is powerful. People don't realize that sometimes. They think it's just words. Lies are just words. Truth is truth. At any rate, uh, people found courage and hope in what he said, and they tore years, and uh, Soviet communism collapsed. Now, I want you guys to understand something. I know that now we look back on it and we think all of this is normal. I remember the day I was driving into work, and I heard on the radio that the Berlin Wall was being torn apart. I remember that very well. And I will tell you, I did not, if you'd asked me the evening before, if I thought that was likely to happen, I would have laughed at you and said, probably not in my lifetime. But it certainly wouldn't be happening in the next 24 hours. It would not be happening in the next year or two or even the next decade. And it happened. If my wife had asked me that morning before I left, dear, what do you think will happen to the Berlin Wall today? I would have thought she was asking me a silly and stupid question. And I suspect that, that anyone who's being honest will admit that. These things happened in a way that... Uh, you know, the, the, cons the, the conventional wisdom, CW, is that appeasement was the way to deal with communists. Today, it's accepted Ronald Reagan did it right. But you have to remember what he was up against. In the 70s and the early 80s, the idea was appeasement was the way to go. The underlying fear was that Khrushchev was right. And he pulled his chair, his shoe off, and beat it on the countertop at the uh, UN and said, we will bury you. Most academics believed he was right. And so they formulated policies designed to get along. And to hopefully foster this sense of don't hate us too much. And Reagan knew better. He knew this was all a bunch of bunk. He knew our system was superior. And he knew that we could not be defeated if we put together the right plan and the right effort. I've got a question. That, that reminds me. You could, you could comment on this. Uh, conventional wisdom is another word for the mass media. It just seemed that the mass media hammered him on a regular basis and all his policies. Did you comment on that? 
Absolutely. Um, again, everything he did, he was the dummy. He was simple-minded. He was. Uh, it wasn't just enough that he was wrong. He was stupid. That's how they dealt with him. And I, and that uh, you know. And yet we know that's not true. And and I. What's interesting is it never seemed to impact the American people. At some point, the media had. That's why that, that headline on Time Magazine. Why is this man so popular? How can it be? We've been telling you what a complete loser he is for so long. Why don't you believe us? And the answer is because we have our own evidence. And you can whisper in my ear all you want that uh, you know, if someone stands there and tells you, yeah, you know, George Landry is Mr. Universe, you go, yeah, no, I can tell he's not. I'm sitting there looking at him. That's not Mr. Universe. It's not near, you know, he's not busting out of suit. So you wouldn't believe, and someone could tell you all day long, I'm Mr. Universe, and I could stay here, I'm Mr. Universe, I really am, I'm Mr. Universe, I'm Mr. Universe. You're just not, you're going to go, uh, he's, he's lying. And that's what the public did. They just essentially tuned the media out. And that was when, that was the beginning of when the public began to distrust the mainstream media. You remember, that there was a time when the media was very well respected. Walter Cronkite, who's actually quite liberal, was very well respected. And it wasn't long hereafter that they became not respected. And it was because they were lying to us every single night, telling us that something that we could visibly see was not true and acting as if it was truth. And I, it may have convinced a few weak-minded people, you know, the people that are susceptible to these aren't the girls you're looking for. But, but for the rest of us who can observe and think, we just, yeah, we knew that they were, they were full of it, and we, we moved along. But I, I love his, uh, his plan was obviously more complex than this, but he said, we win, they lose. And he, and he had, like I said, he understood it was about morality, it was about missile defense, it was about building a strong military, it was about building a strong economy. And he did all of that. And he undermined the Soviets economically, morally, that's why he, he understood. He, his goal was to strengthen us and to point out their immorality. That's why he called them the evil empire. That's why he went after them, to, to take out from them those sorts of things. Because he, it was a very complex strategy. He was playing 3D chess, and he got the Washington Post saying he's got nothing in between his ears. Okay, and who's the dummy? All right, well, of course, these are results that, no, as I just said, nobody could have foreseen. I, I didn't foresee this happening. It just happened almost overnight. Stunning kind of event. It happened in, in, in his lifetime. I think people thought when he was, you know, that this is a long-term plan, that he began the slow, long process of defeating Soviet communism. It happened in his lifetime. At any rate, so to me, now what's amazing to me is there in Eastern Europe and around the world, there are some memorials and plazas and statues erected to Ronald Reagan. I don't know if you know that or not, but there are. I'm going to show you a couple. Uh, right here, this one is in uh, Hungary. You see right there? His signature. That's in Freedom Square. Recently named Freedom Square in Hungary. Statue of Ronald Reagan. The Budapest? Correct. And then... I've named a street for him, Ronald Reagan Way. I hope you can make that out. Of course, it's uh, in Czech, so they've added a few extra letters there. But that's Ronald Reagan, and that's in the Czech Republic, an avenue named after our president. And then this, of course, is in London. So, um, and th those aren't the only ones, but I, I didn't want to necessarily waste all your time with pictures of things in Europe. But, but the bottom line is, these are people who view him as a liberator. They don't view him as a Republican or a Democrat or a conservative or whatever. He was a champion of freedom, and he helped them win their freedom, and he inspired them to win their freedom, and they loved him for it. So, the last thing I kind of want to point out here is that Reagan was popular because he was right. He was not right because he was popular, and that's an important lesson. I just want to point out, Lyndon Johnson didn't even seek re-election in 1968. Nixon was forced to resign. This is important because I want us to understand how unusual his presidency was. Gerald Ford could not win an election. He became president through means other than a national election. Jimmy Carter could not win re-election. George H. W. Bush could not win re-election. William Jefferson Clinton won re-election, but he never got 50% of the vote, ever. George W. Bush did win re-election twice in two very, very tight elections. Essentially, uh, you know, 50-50 elections. And, of course, Barack Obama is the only president who was re-elected but won fewer popular votes and fewer electoral votes in his second term than he did his first. That's never Anybody who won a second term always did better the second term. They didn't do worse. And, and that's it. So <clears throat> National Geographic did a poll. They asked Americans, 
in an election, in a, in a, in a election between Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama, who would you vote for? Ronald Reagan won more than he would have won in 1980. His landslide victory in 1980. Nearly 60% of the vote. And remarkably, in the demographic from 18 to 34, people who were not alive when he was president, people who did not know him as president, could have no recollection of him, he won with that group, and that's the group that powered Barack Obama to the presidency. And they would vote for Ronald Reagan. Again, Ronald Reagan was not great because he was popular. He was popular because he was great. And he was popular because he was right. And I think that's important. There's, truth is powerful. And I think too often, see, he understood in politics, he understood that good, poli good policy, being right, actually makes for good politics. And too many politicians spend their time trying to figure out, look at the polls and figure out what will get me a bump in today's, in today's uh, discussion on the new evening news. And they don't just say, if I do the right thing, good things flow from that. Now, the media tells you that's simplistic. I would just say it's an eternal truth. You can't get around it. It's not simplistic. It just is. It's like gravity. At any rate, I just want to conclude as I began, because I think this is the essence I want to write it. It captures so much of what he was about. I wasn't a great communicator, but I communicated great things. And they didn't spring full bloom from my blood. They came from the heart of a great nation. From our experience, our wisdom, and our belief in the principles that have guided us for two centuries. I love that. Because it, it, it encapsulates so much of what I've talked about here tonight. So now the question is, what can we do about Reagan? It's great that Reagan was great. I, what I hope we do is that we learn from his example. I think we have to make sure that we're always communicating great things. You guys are conservatives. You guys are actually very influential. So when you're talking to your friends, communicate great things. Don't communicate small things about conservatism. Go to the big things. Like I said, one of the small things about conservatism is that we can run things a little more efficiently than they can. What are the big things? The big things are that we can provide opportunity for millions of Americans. That they can have a better life and a better hope. That they can provide for their children's future. That they can have freedom and opportunity. These are big things. When you have a chance to give an A answer, don't give them your C answer. Give them your A answer. That's what Ronald Reagan did. He gave them the A answer every time. Be fluent in the principles of freedom. And if you, if you don't feel like you understand them 100%, you know, your gut get them, but you're not sure you can articulate them, that's okay. You can work on that, because you do get them in your gut. That's why you're conservative. But you can get it. And then I, lastly, remember why freedom matters. It's a little bit like the, the, the concept of you know, always giving you know, the great things. But we're conservatives for a reason. It's not just because we think that we're better than you know, the other party or that you know, we have, you know, our logo's cooler. It's, it's, it's about big ideas. It's, it's a very important. I would argue it's the sort of stuff, um, well, I, I don't know that, I'm going to go down a limb here. I do not believe that God is indifferent as to the condition that his children live in. I think he's on the side of freedom. I think that's why at certain times in the Revolutionary War, you, you have George Washington talking about divine providence and odd circumstances that led to victories that should have not been victories. And times when defeats would have been crushing, but somehow some event, some, some storms, some fog, some other thing happened that allowed his little army to escape a disaster. I don't think God's indifferent. Now, I don't know that he plays a part in politics, but he is not indifferent in the condition that his children live in. And that's why Ronald Reagan didn't talk so much about politics. We talked about principles that matter. And we need to do the same thing. And we need to be able to lift people and be optimistic. And as we do that, the truth is, we'll be able to win over America in a way that will be incredible. And you will see landslide victories for us because these principles are timeless. Americans understand this stuff. They just want somebody who can speak it fluently to them. Too often the candidates look like they can't speak it fluently. They look like it's a second language. And they look like they have to read it off a teleprompter because it's not really coming from their heart. So it's not convincing. So we need to do that, and then we need to seek out leaders like that. But, but ultimately, it begins with us. You know, we, we're the in America. If we don't like what's going on, the truth is we ought to look inward. It's us because we're the we're where it all starts.
I want to thank you for your commitment to freedom. I know that you had a lot of things you'd be doing tonight. You could have been in many places tonight, you at home in your jammies relaxing. And instead, you're here tonight listening to me drone on. I appreciate that, though, because freedom is worth fighting for. And it's important. And too many people think it's perhaps too difficult. Or they're worried that they can't make a difference. I appreciate you being here. I just want to encourage you to invite more of your friends to be involved and to be that great community and, um, and have America have this great resurgence as we resurge back to these principles, timeless principles, that will make America the, uh, the great and wonderful place that we all know it is and it can achieve the greatness that we know it should achieve. And I leave that with you and uh, just again with a word of thanks for you being here and for your commitment because the price of freedom is truly eternal vigilance and uh, I appreciate your vigilance. So thank you so much. So thank you, George. The traditional Ronald Reagan lecture series gift is <laughs> the jelly bean. All right, the Reagan tradition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, now, and we have the door prize. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I'll let you know since you were here in the home looking to the primary results in case you're waiting with bated breath <coughs> that Ohio, despite only 6% has been reported, has been called for Kasich. Um, Clinton and um, Trump have won Florida and nothing else has been called. And Rubio right. has suspended his, his race. Wow, Rubio has suspended his race. Wow, wow! I tell you, the world is hopping fast. Things happen. All right, so now one more bit of business. Um, we get to choose the door prize, present the door prize. Thank you for filling these out because we want to better, uh, you know, serve the, the interests uh, of our of our attendees. Because <laughs> <laughs> people don't trust lawyers. <laughs> 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 And the winner is <gasps> Rosellen Ray. Yay! Come on down! <laughs> Yay! So, um, yeah, on that note, I, I would like to express our, our gratitude to Nancy Reagan for her service, her sacrifices, you know, her faith, her strength. Um, and especially her example as a first lady. Much to learn from her. Uh, she was as elegant and noble as her husband. And um, <coughs> I have an email address that is at Reagan.com. And on the, uh, on the front screen of that, of that service, they had something about um, we we give condolences to the family and we thank uh, Nancy Reagan for her service. And then it said, um, Ron and Nancy had a deep love for one another, and it is through our uh, through our, our strong belief that we we know that they are now together for eternity. And I just thought that, that was a beautiful thought. In closing, <coughs> I want to reiterate uh, one, of the, one of the threads of George's message. In the Bible, 
the book of Leviticus says, and ye shall proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And that's the mission of RRLS. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Oh, we have one? Yes, Jen? Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah.